We had we, the last episode was a very fun episode. Yeah, we got to talk about a lot of that one D and D playtest. Yeah, it was a very fun episode. Today, not so much. No, no. We, is, there's a lot of there's a lot of sad. As as is usual in the the D and D world, we ping pong or the D and D community community we ping large. pong between. Yeah. So many. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. It's, we're getting we're getting emotional whiplash over here in the TTRPG community. Maybe not the wider. Well, even even so, I've got one story of just like a completely fucked up thing from some random publishing. Mm-hmm. Whatever. Um, regardless, we wanna we wanna welcome you to this the Dungeon Bros podcast. I'm Connor and I'm Sam, and we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And um, we're sponsored yet again mm-hmm. this week. Uh, we're sponsored. We have two sponsors. You. We have two sponsors. First sponsor. Uh, where do we hit into critty? Uh, have you? Do you roll natural 20s at your table? We do, and it's a fun time. And you know the best thing you can do when you hit, roll that natural 20 yeah. is what do we hit that quitty? So... Wanna make sure you heard us right. It's not hitting hit, not hitting that quitty. No, no, no. No, no, no. no this is hitting the quitty. What are we hitting the quitty? Critty. Quitty. Don't quit. Don't quit. You just crit. You just, don't quit, because you just crit. What are we hitting a critty? Use code Dungeon Bros at checkout. Second sponsor, um, TikTok Live is bullshit. <laughs> TikTok Live Studio, uh, the 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 great software, the gr- the great software from TikTok for live streaming. If you want to do things like any other streamer would on any other streaming platform, don't get a stream key. Use this shitty software that doesn't work well. TikTok Live Studio. Uh, use code Dungeon Bros to don't use it. <laughs> just just don't use it. <laughs> because it is a it is a a technical. It's very... the, this is in reference to uh, last Monday, as of the recording of this, uh, our our weekly Magic the Gathering live stream, where we play Magic the Gathering live on TikTok. And one of the main requests we have gotten is for an overhead cam. And when you normally stream on TikTok and you use just your phone. You uh, you can't really get a whole bunch of different angles. You can't use something like OBS to put like the game score on screen and all that kind of stuff. And we were wanting to do that. Yeah. So we built. I built it out in OBS. We had this wonderful setup. Uh, TikTok doesn't let you use a stream key, which is the way people connect software like OBS to Twitch or YouTube or wherever else they live stream, Instagram well, Reels, etc. There is a way to use a stream key. But TikTok doesn't want us in particular. Yes. Their, their rollout of who has access to stream keys is very sporadic and random and nonsensical in many regards. Um, basically, the people that get access to stream keys, it, it's just a roll of the dice. And it seems like they kind of favor video game streamers who do that really shitty TikTok stream where they just... They're streaming on like Twitch or YouTube or something, and then they just point their camera, their phone at their monitor where OBS is, and then have like a te- like text saying "Go to my Twitch," and then like a mirror to show their face. Those are the kinds of people that get stream keys, not the people that are actively properly trying to use the TikTok live streaming app and innovate and do things that other people aren't doing on TikTok. No, not them. No, not them. No, not them. Uh, but we tried to we tried to do it properly through TikTok Live Studio. And we have this great setup. We have an overhead cam. You can see if you're watching the live on TikTok where we record the podcast live every week or every two weeks and totally on time every yeah, single time. Not missing We'd be never, never late, not once, except the times that we are. Um, we have this wonderful overhead. We had like graphics and all this stuff and it just, it wouldn't, it was crashing. It was just not working. Partly, I would say... My laptop's not powerful enough. I'm going to bring a, my desktop up here. To yeah, try your it. laptop was about ready to take off into the stratosphere. It was, it was about to explode. But even when we've had success, we have in the past had more simple streams that were successful in in the execution phase. Where, like, if we were streaming from our phone, doing our Match of the Gathering live stream, we, could, we can expect upwards of 20 concurrent for most of the stream. Sometimes we've had streams where we've had over 70 people for like the entire time just watching us play Magic the Gathering, Crack Packs, whatever. When we use TikTok Live Studio, we struggle to stay above seven, Mm -hmm. even when everything's technically working just fine. So that's that diet. Not bitter. Not bitter. That's that diet tribe out of the way. Uh, Second item, 
at the, at the top. We've got merch. We do. We've got stickers. We do. We have shirts. We do. And and we have a zip up hoodie. And I want to make I want to make a tank top as well. Got to got to rep the tank. It's summertime. We got to do that tank spank. Got to do. Ooh. We'll leave that for uh, the OnlyFans. The tank spank. The tank spank. <laughs> the Dungeon Bros OnlyFans. What about the flank spank? Oh. The, the move where if you can yes. draw a straight line between two miniatures, the thing yes. in the center. Yes, the, the the variant. It is a variant roll. It flanking. is a variant roll. Love flanking. It's a great, it's a great roll. But you can get you can get them at at uh, link in the link tree in the bio. We use the stream element shop uh, for merch, and we each got. I got a t-shirt. I got a jacket. And the quality the quality is pretty good. Surprising. Pretty good. I was a little surprised, to be honest. I the the material is very soft. I will say. Definitely put that thing inside out and run it through the wash first before you wear it because the printing from the factory you get a little bit itchy on the inside, so be sure to wash it once go. Uh, and I personally, I don't know if my my arm, my biceps are just becoming massive because of all my working out, but it's a little bit tight in the sleeves for me. Wow. Other than that, though, I, I, I the printing quality on it was very nice. The material was wonderful. Check it out. We tried to make it as affordable as possible without literally losing money on it. So there you go. There's that. Uh, Gen Con. Gen Con, the events, you can sign up for events at the Gen Con Indie website now. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be going to Gen Con along with our friends from Role Playing Degenerates. Uh, our friend Norb Fell the Lab on YouTube is going, uh, Vitamin Ditter, some other uh, people on the internet that we are friends with. And we're going to be playing lots of Magic the Gathering. We want to do some, some play testing of new board games that aren't out yet. Uh, uh, I want to do some, I want to do some learn to plays. Was, last mm -hmm. year we went and our big problem was we just went to like, uh, uh, seminars basically. There, there were so many great. There's so many great talks. Yeah, they, they were really quality, but it felt like school. Oh my god, yeah, we just. Uh, but when we got to like walk around the show floor, and when we actually did uh, signed up to do some learn to plays, those were the real fun parts. Oh yeah, um, got. Uh, uh, I managed to slip in for early access to do D and D onslaught, mm -hmm. which the game is fun. Zero marketing movement. Zero. I don't know what the fuck's going on with that game, but it was it was fun and the minis are cool. But there there's a ton of things that we would love to. I would love to do try out some more TTRPGs. Yeah, there's a lot. There's like Pathfinder demos that are an hour. I want to try like Vampire the Masquerade. Yeah, there are also a lot of indie ones that people will mm -hmm. uh, do. And I've been playing some indie some some indie art TTRPGs recently. Playing kids on bikes, mm -hmm. uh, but then looking for other ones to get ready to do after that kids on bikes mini campaign ends yeah. and i was looking through and i was like oh this would be a great opportunity like oh i saw that one that mm -hmm. I've, I've wanted to get the book for i've saw that so i would love to look into some, I, some like dungeon crawl classics mm -hmm. that kind of stuff like that old school kind of style dungeon uh there's also a, a ttrpg system that um well uh oh gosh bob the world builder on youtube he was talking about it's called cairn which is like a really systems light RPG system. Um, it, it, you can get it for free on um, on Drive Through RPG, or you can pay like three dollars to get the soft cover mm -hmm. book. I, it seemed very interesting from what he was talking about. Very, very quick to like create a character. Very quick to start playing, and it it seems interesting. I would love to try out more stuff like that. And of course, on the on the show floor at Gen Con, just all of the board games. Oh yeah, all of the board games to try. They will. They will. They will swindle you, and by swindle, I mean they'll give you an awesome, they'll show you an awesome product, and you'll go home and buy it. Work yes. buy it there. Go yes. home and buy it. Um, this is not. I, I want to get this out of the way at the top, just because I don't want to linger on it for too long. Because as the internet is often known to do, reactionaries mm -hmm. do be reacting, and it's very clear that uh, one of our one of one of the the critical role darlings, Ashley Johnson, star of The Last of Us. Not really the star of. She was in the last. Well, star of the video game, The Last of Us. Yes. The show appeared. She, she was. She appeared in. Regardless, Ashley Johnson of Critical Role is where you would know her. Uh, recently, there have been some public court filings that we have found out where she has uh, filed a restraining order against who we now know is ex boyfriend Brian W. Foster, alleging claims of uh, attempted extortion. Uh, verbal and physical assaults on her and her mother and sister and nephews and nieces. Um, supposedly, he family members have been the subject of outbursts. Uh, he's apparently been deep in narcotics use, uh, made threats, sexual assault, that kind of stuff. Uh, 
Ashley has remained very, very silent on this. And as such, we should probably respect that and just let the proceedings go as as they will go. Um, it's very sad to hear. Um, if you want to follow it and not bring it up all the time and pester Ashley or Brian or whoever else about it, mm -hmm. um, the next there there's going to be a hearing on June 9th, which I'm sure we'll hear more about. But uh, it's very sad to hear. Ashley Johnson is a sweetheart and amazing. And yeah, don't be a dick. Don't don't abuse people. Don't try to extort them. That's the that was a weird one. Yeah. Like obvi like obviously, Kirk World Cats, they're doing well. They're not they're not exorbitantly wealthy by any means. But one Brian W. Foster. It is a, it is an unfortunate situation all the way around. Um and if something big does come up, we'll probably talk about it at that point. But right yes. now it's just a we know very little. We know very little and of course TikTok, Twitter, all of all of the places are just running rampant with what they think and outrage. And it's like, yes, you can be upset. It's probably true. I would, I would venture like I don't think Ashley Johnson would file a a false report by any means. Let's all just like let them handle it. If she wanted people to know. She would let people know. Mm -hmm. If you want to do something about it and show support, go donate to the Critical Role Foundation. That's Ashley's brainchild. That's her little her project there. So donate money. There's a lot of great charities there. There you go. Fair? Moving on. Cool. Upcoming releases. Uh, Wizards of the Coast announced the details of the remaining releases for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. We have proper names. We have proper release dates. And... We have a new project that uh, will be coming out in August that we were not aware of. That they just kind of were like, oh yeah, we're doing this too. So we have, of course, Bigby Presents The Glory of the Giants on August 15th. Also on August 15th, quote, The Practically Complete Guide to Dragons will release, giving some more dragon options, because we don't have enough of those already. We also have Fandelver and Below the Shattered Obelisk on September 19th. Many people were speculating that this Fandelver campaign would involve all the obelisks that have been showing up in the various D&D adventure books yes. that have just kind of not really been doing a whole lot, but have been inconspicu like conspicuously just like hanging out. Mm -hmm. And there's always a, part, a section talking about it, and then nothing really comes of it. So we'll learn more about that. Planescape, Adventures in the Multiverse, will be October 16th, and then The Book of Many Things... The Deck of Many Things, I believe, is the official name of it now. Which uh, is a bit strange, because that's just the item. Regardless, I book, have it right. book of many things. Yeah, the Book of Many Things. All right, cool. One of the write-ups I saw was just totally wrong. The Book of Many Things, November 14th. All of these before the end of 2023. I would venture a guess that pretty much all of these are not going to be worth getting, particularly since we are on the cusp of the 5th edition update with 1D&D, &D, because it is not going to be its own edition, which is stupid. Should just be 5.5, should or just call it one D and D as the name. Yeah, I, the idea that it's just the 2024 revision of fifth edition is fucking stupid, because now people are going to like look for like all of the content on YouTube, TikTok, anywhere else of how to play D and D five E, all this kind of stuff. People that may come into it in like 2025, 2026 are gonna want to learn how to play the newest revision. They're not going to know that it's the newest revision if they're just going to call it 5th edition. It's a whole... Yeah. I mean, slightly side tangent, but if you're going to put out an entire new rule book, and if you're playtesting a bunch of new changes mm -hmm. and drastic... I get that they're compatible. Yeah. it, But it... It, it needs a differentiator. Exactly. A, a 5e fighter is very different from a 1D&D &D fighter. Yeah. It... It's just very different. Uh, yes, we know about the price increases. We'll get to that when we get to the meat. In a hot a bit, second. A little bit later. Don't don't think we're just ignoring that. Because we're not. We will. We're get on it. it. We are on it. But the upcoming Magic the Gathering releases, as we are also big fans of the Magic and the Gatherings. Mm -hmm. We gather all that magic. Ooh. Lord of the Rings, Tales of Middle Earth, June 23rd. This is the next release. One month. One month away. Are you so excited? I'm going to lose a lot of money. <laughs> uh, Commander Masters, August 4th. 
The Wilds of Eldraine, we're going to get pre-release on September 1st with a launch on September 8th. We got the Doctor Who Commander decks, Universes Beyond, on October 13th, and the Lost Caverns of Ixalan at some point in November of 2023. Still too many releases. A lot of releases. A lot of releases. Oh, and oh, not even, and we don't even get into all the various secret lair drops mm-hmm. that are just always happening. And as a note, the the Lord of the Rings set will have a re-release, a holiday Ooh, yes. re-release in November. Yes, some new with new, even more card designs, which is I feel like the first time they've ever done. Here's a set, and then here's an expansion to that set where it's just the set with some new stuff in it. It sounds kind of like one of the a, a dumb aftermath move, but we'll right. have to see how that. See, I was the, I was just thinking that they were originally doing like, oh, this will be a great holiday gift, like great Christmas gift, great yeah. great Hanukkah gift. That would be great. Um, one last thing about Magic the Gathering before we get into the proper news. Uh, it seems like they're going to release a new ban and restricted list in the coming days, and some standard some standard staples are going to be getting the axe. Uh, I know one of them being Fable. What is it? Fables of the Mirror Breaker. That saga. Yeah. Kiki Jiki's, yeah, the yeah. Fable that, or yeah, the saga that includes the Kiki Jiki on the backside. Yeah, yeah, that one. That one seems like it's gonna be gone. You can kind of you, one way that the community can kind of tell is they look at um, when MTG Arenas starts offering steeply discounted card styles for very popular consequential cards. That's usually a precursor to them being banned. Right. <laughs> Like, like um, Swords to Plowshares, I remember uh, I, I remember seeing people talking about when they started offering it for, like, 100 gems for the really fancy art styles of Swords to Plowshares for various formats when mm-hmm. it was getting more... Ba- it was... It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. So, be prepared for MTG bans. We don't know the specifics of them yet, but let's get into the news. We've got... Th- Two major stories, I would say. One kind of major story, and then a couple wrap-up items. Um, one of the wrap-up items, we'll get into what the uh, Practically Complete Guide to Dragons is. It's part of the wrap-up. But first, community update on D&D Beyond. New release print price increases. D&D Core rulebooks have remained largely unchanged in the pricing structure for a while now since the release in 2014. And uh, according to them, quote, unfortunately, with the cost of goods and shipping continually increasing, we finally had to make the decision to increase the price of our new release print books. Ellipses. This will go into effect starting with Bigby Presents the Glory of the Giants and new releases after Glory of the Giants. Digital pricing is unaffected by the MSRP increase as digital products do not have a need to be printed or shipped. The increase does not impact the backlist titles, so titles that have already come to market. While we can't promise there will never be a change to the prices of digital products and backlist titles, they have no plans to increase those prices either. Players who purchase the Big B Presents Glory of the Giants digital physical bundle through the Dungeons & Dragons store will be able to get the bundle for $59.95 for the entire pre-order window, which is consistent with the current digital physical bundle pricing. After the pre-order window closes, digital physical bundle prices will go to $69.95. Nice. Uh, very very nice on the on the number. Not very nice that it is a price yes. increase. Uh, one thing that I've been seeing a lot, people have been drawing comparisons to video games. And rightfully so. Video games used to cost $60. Pretty much flat out $60. And with the newest uh, generation of game consoles, the PlayStation 5, the Xbox Series X, uh, video games are now costing... Seventy dollars if they're triple A. Triple A meaning highest budget, mm-hmm. gate, like the hundred million dollar budget, twenty five million dollar budget games, like massive projects. Uh, and people are comparing them. Uh, they they sh- I saw one image on Twitter where they were comparing. Th- this user was comparing uh, Big B presents the glory of the dragons or glory of the giants to Elden Ring, and it just showed the box art of the two, and is like these are both sixty dollars. One of them is going to be a much better quality. Can you tell which one? Uh, implying Elden Ring being a much higher quality game. Um, price increases are never fun. Obviously, the economics, I'm sure for them, are not great with physical book sales, especially with inflation running rampant and the cost of everything being so much more. Um, 
not a great time to really be announcing this and kind of just sweeping it under a D&D community update thread on D&D Beyond and not properly explaining it and trying to hide it behind uh, here's all of the new books and release dates and we're going to give you some more info about all of them. Not really great to hear. We've known for a while uh, that <laughs> that the people the people at the top of Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast have interest in in what was what was the phrase they used turning a month or turning a uh, quarterly buying cycle into a regular spending environment yeah um obviously yes things budget you know it, we could call it part you know partially from just the fact that money becomes less valuable over time due to inflation we could you know say that it is due to the and i, I do want to point out inflation is out of fucking control oh right absolutely now. it's so much worse than than normal right now but they can point out that you know oh look you know dig printing and shipping has gotten harder which it has but at the same time uh, i just looked at dnd beyond the digital price if you're just pre-ordering the digital only $30, $29.99. So if you buy the bundle, it's $30 for the digital and $30 for the physical. Mm-hmm. So, you know, are they really are they really struggling that much that they want you to, to do they want to sell sell you both? Absolutely. They want you to spend as much money as possible. Well, they've also already committed with uh, one D and D books and one and books going forward with one D and D that when you buy a physical book you're going to get a digital version on D and D Beyond with it. Exactly. Whether or not they try and go back on it and make it a bundle where it costs ten fifteen dollars more to get the digital version, I would not be surprised. No. It's like it's just it's, this is exactly like buying college textbooks. I know it's you can get the book for a hundred dollars, but oh wait, you need the digital code in order to uh, in order to do your homework based on the book. Yeah, here's an, it's going to cost you another hundred dollars. Um, will we get this book? Maybe. Is it that interesting? Honestly, like you know, here's 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 what it comes down to for me: core rule books. Player's Handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, Monster Manual, Major Rule Supplements, Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Tasha's Cold of Everything. I could understand those costing a bit more. Campaigns, mm -hmm. campaign books, campaign settings, even. I could understand those costing a bit more. But what we're getting a lot of recently are these smaller, skinnier... Like if, if you bought the, the three-pack of... Spelljammer books. Those books are small. They are, yes. They are very, they are thin. very, very small. Um, a book like Bigby Presents the Glory of the Giants. That That's not a core rule supplement. Practically Complete D Guide to Dragons. That is not a core rule supplement. Fend Over and Below. That is a campaign. Mm-hmm. Don't know what the size of it is. Planescape seems like a setting book. And then The Deck of Many Things, that's not a $60 book. No. A lot of... I feel like they need to be exploring the price spectrum with their products more. You want something that is affordable for someone to get into for your player's handbook, your dungeon master's guide, your monster manual. I could see that like $29.99, $39.99 in that range for a physical book, I get that. Mm -hmm. Something like Bigby Presents Glory of the Giants, that should be a cool 20 bucks. Yeah, here, 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 let me, let me briefly, uh, here's the, the sh cliff notes of what they plan to add. It adds giant themed player character options for one new barbarian subclass, the Path of the Giant. Uh, it adds two new backgrounds and eight new feats unleash, to unleash magic, uh, runic and magic, uh, uh, runic magic and wield elemental powers. Uh, it adds 30 new magic items, including three illustrious artifacts. Encounter over 70 new monsters and other enormous creatures, and a plethora of tools in the dungeon uh, for the dungeon master included. 79 or 76 stat blocks covering the gambit of challenge rating one half up to what is that 27? Yeah. 
and that's that's not a lot of things. No. Like like when we that's uh, not sixty dollars. No, and and no, you know, for one new subclass and two new backgrounds and eight new feats. I bet you you could find all of these things in the free uh, in the free uh, in unearthed arcanas that they oh put out. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Just go like I'm. I'm more interested in. I'll just go if I want to play some of this stuff. I'll point out that hey, if it's if it's not you or I, obviously. Who's running the game? I'll be like, hey, can I play this this Bath, Path of the Barbarian uh, subclass? It's in this Unearthed Arcana. It's the exact same, and I'm not paying seventy dollars for it. Yeah, or even even more. Once the book is out, you can just use online resources for it. I don't think they're truly understanding the value proposition of their products, and they're just expecting people to not have the self control. To say no. Mm -hmm. And if, and based on a price increase, if it goes from, what were books, like 40 bucks? Yeah, I think I've gotten most of my books at 40 bucks. 30 to 40 dollars, and they bump it to 60. That's 50% of the original price increase. If more than half of the people still buy the book at the increased price, they're making more money. It's a numbers game, and that's all it is. The only way stuff like this stops is if they stop selling books. Mm -hmm. If people stop buying the books, it doesn't matter how much they're going to increase the price. They're going to have to change the product to be profitable. Uh, Another comparison here. The lauded Tal'Dorei campaign setting Reborn from Darrington Press Critical Role. $50, $49.99. $50, $49.99. It has, the price on that has remained unchanged since its release. It is a massive book. It is a campaign setting. It has dozens of magic items, the Vestiges of the Divergence, so many new stat blocks, powerful stat blocks, character options, feats, everything. It is a massive book with amazing print quality in the colors, the cardstock, everything. And... If you buy it from the Critical Role shop at $50, you get the PDF of it. Mm -hmm. That is a premium product for a third-party D&D book. That is a premium product. And now products like Glory of the Giants is $60? Yeah. No. We're... I don't know about you... I I was kind of interested in the Fandelver campaign because of the obelisks. I was kind of interested in the whole multiversal stuff with Planescape, but at sixty dollars, I'm not. If this is the price of their of their books going forward, I'll get the player's handbook, the dungeon master's guide, and the monster manual, mm-hmm. and that'll be it. Yeah, we'll figure everything else out on our own because clearly. Find the rest online. There, if you really want other things, there's plenty of people who out there who love to make homebrew options, um, and and give them out for free. Well, you have to sometimes, you know, check and double and double check and balance all your stuff. Sure, but you didn't have to do that in a D and D campaign anyway. Don't don't do this. Don't do this. Five e dot tools. Just look at that. Just go look that up. Don't go look that up, you mean. Don't yeah, no, don't don't go look that up. Do not look up 5e.tools. Don't type that into your browser bar. Don't Google it. Nothing. 5e period T O O L S. Do not search that. That's all I have to say. All right, well, that's that's Big V's. Uh, Big V's gl- presents the glory of Let's giants. Go. We yeah. got we got some we got the other books. Uh, the practically complete guide to dragons. Um, more, more dragon stuff. We've got we very recently got Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons. It's one of the first episodes of the podcast about what year and a half year now. and a half two years ago now. Um, updated lore and art. New ways of thinking about dragons giving some more details on how they live, about their enemies. They they kind of alluded that this one wasn't going to be $60. So we'll see. Uh, Fendever Below, the Shattered Obelisk, going to be for fans of traditional dungeon crawls, hearkening back to the sleepy frontier town of Fandolin, where, where if you remember, Fandelver, the first 
5e campaign that was released the um, first five yeah the starter campaign yes. the original starter campaign so the setting for those in the original starter set this time dms and players will find out more about the area and the people in that area for a fully crafted campaign it also ties into previous adventures as it deepens the mystery of strange obelisks found across Faerun. uh venture will go from levels 1 to 12 1 to 12 Read that as this is a big campaign book. Yeah, sixty dollars. I I would say that's of the ones we've walked through so far. That would probably be the most valuable one. If you're buying a campaign book and it takes you from level one to something above ten, that is a big book. Three to twelve, big book. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse. Oh boy. Longtime fans will likely remember Planescape, critically acclaimed and fan beloved setting from the TSR days in 1994, and as a massively popular video game, Planescape Torment, released in 99. The fresh new campaign collection, comprised of three hardcover books spanning an in depth look at the city of Sigil, the center of the multiverse, an examination of the outlands and wild realms, a bestiary detailing the wild and fantastical creatures players will encounter, and an adventure like no other throwing players into a plot that threatens to undermine the rules of reality and the very fabric of the multiverse. Ooh, an adventure like no other. I feel like that's every adventure that they try to sell. Oh my gosh, yes. And we briefly mentioned it. They did a similar thing with... Spelljammer. Spelljammer. Of the, here's the setting book, here's the campaign book, and here's the monster manual. And those books were small. Mm -hmm. They were very small books. The entire three-pack box set that we got was $40, I think. Yeah, yeah, actually, I think it was less than that. Yeah, because we, we got it on sale on Amazon briefly after it came out. Weeks after it was out, because it was weeks, not selling yeah. very well. And on the shelf... It's like one and a half core rule books. Like it's the size of a player's handbook and Xanathar's together. And that's including the the case it comes in. Yeah. The, little, the cardboard adds an extra, you know, centimeter overall. Yeah, it's hopefully Planescape they give a little more heft to it. But uh more heft, more thought. If they're gonna bring back I don't have any problem with these them bringing back these classic mm -hmm. sort of uh, Absolutely. things. Especially since, you know, they've been popular for a very long time. And but if you're not going to put the effort around it, which they definitely didn't put the effort into the mechanics or the care around, uh, which caused the care of the product itself and for the community, which caused them a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, caused a lot of backlash towards them. So hopefully they make sure to read everything this time. Yeah. That would be, <laughs> that'd be nice. <laughs> we don't need, we don't need another Hadozi situation for sure. But the trend that I've been seeing when they want they wanted Spelljammer to be a big thing and the Hodozi controversy aside it could have been a big thing mm -hmm. if the campaign book were a little bit longer a little bit more fleshed out a little more detailed better if they included I don't know rules for for Spelljammer combat maybe an encounter in the campaign where your Spelljammer is fighting another Spelljammer Basic shit like that was being ignored. Mm -hmm. it, Planescape, I am skeptical of because of it being a three box set. Fendelver and Below, The Shattered Obelisk, I am less skeptical of because it's one book. Mm -hmm. and it's one book, and they pretty much already have it half written with the Lost Minds of Fendelver yeah. campaign or uh, beginner it's, campaigns. So. And it's going to tie in with the other campaign books that have the obelisks that we already know are pretty good campaigns. They haven't really released bad campaigns. For the most part. There's been a couple slogs. Mm -hmm. But their campaigns have been pretty alright at best. Uh, and then last, The Deck of Many Things and its accompanying book, The Book of Many Things. The legendary 22 cards are back and ready to be used by players and DMs alike. In addition, the new deck includes 44 additional cards that can be substituted to customize the play experience. The accompanying book of many things will showcase new character options, magic items, adventure locations, monsters, and more, all inspired by the deck. An additional companion book provides advice and background to each of the cards. This guidebook shows how the cards will be used as a traditional oracle deck or to create adventures inspired by the cards. Sure. Deck of Many Things is cool. Yeah. 
tripling the number of options in the deck of many things is neat. It's interesting, especially since a lot of the deck of many things options aren't necessarily things that people currently play with. Or the average, I would say, the average campaign doesn't play with. Like for example, I know one of the things is like the you know the character draws this card gets so much XP. Yeah. And I would I would say at least a vast majority of people we hear about campaigns from it's all um, milestone leveling. So yeah, that for example isn't very useful. But um, I don't know if if you you need an entire book to tell you how to make adventures on those cards. I feel like that's almost a a I'm I'm a new DM. That's an awesome thing. I can just do that. Like that's a good starting point for a new for a new DM to do you know some of their first homebrew campaign. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that some of these products are going to be great. I can't recommend buying anything until one D and D is out at this point, mm-hmm. especially because they're trying to jam more products into that time. They're right. trying to spell jam those products right in there, right in there, right directly into their, right into their product lineup. Not a fan of that. Uh, the last major quote unquote, uh, bit of news we want to get through. This is reported by Gizmodo. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons has revealed their plans for a 24 hour streaming channel, including three new shows. Hasbro announced that it is rolling out Dungeons & Dragons Adventure, a new free, ad-supported television channel that will feature a variety of shows from familiar faces. Although Entertainment One, the video and game media arm of Hasbro, hasn't announced the distribution yet, Variety reports that it is, quote, expected to be available on multiple platforms. First up in the initiative order, I hate that, I hate, <laughs> I hate you Gizmodo for writing that, three, quote, celebrity-focused unscripted series which include the cast of the AP podcast Encounter Party, returning for a full-produced video actual play, Faster Purple Worm, Kill Kill, from Matthew Lilliard, a.k.a. Scooby-Doo. Yeah. No, Shaggy and Scooby-Doo. That's correct. Yes, also Shaggy the, and Scooby-Doo, live action. Also the owner, uh, uh, the Grimm and Beetle and Grimm. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Matthew Lilliard's a joy. He's a joy. And a cooking series, Heroes Feast. Additionally, Hasbro says the channel will feature both older content, like the 1980s animated D&D series, as well as, quote, third-party content from internet crea- from top internet creators and influencers with a focus on live gameplay. You know what that means? You won't see us on there. Yep. <laughs> though, though, Hasbro, if... If you're looking for someone. If you're looking for a live play commander show for Magic the Gathering... Because I feel like if you're trying to fill 24 hours of a D&D channel, you are not going to be able to do that. <laughs> it's going to take a day. long time to evolve enough content. <laughs> you, you remember when G4 had a TV TV channel and 90% of it was just reruns of Ninja Warrior and American Ninja Warrior? That's what that channel will become. Unless they branch out a little bit. They yeah. just they just continuously so, play the old D and D with Hank the Ranger. That would be great. <laughs> just the Hank the Ranger channel. Yeah, every every month they go through. God, and probably every week they go through the entire eighties cartoon series in reruns. For those of you that are curious, Encounter Party will feature the original creators of the podcast, including Ned Donovan and Kari Payton of The Walking Dead, and has also appeared on Critical Role. Uh, it will be an original D and D campaign in the Forgotten Realms. Faster Purple Worm, Kill Kill, is a variety improv show using D&D characters as players act out dying in monster encounters, and is going to be filmed in front of a live audience. Heroes Feast is a cooking competition and talk show based on the recipes of the Heroes Feast cookbook. While these three shows are professionally produced and have been in the works for a long time, it is very interesting to see what, quote, internet creators and influencers get tapped to be a part of this channel. No date has been announced for the release of this channel. I suspect this will end up not happening where it'll start you know like we heard a lot of uh a lot of promises last year um at the uh what is the D announcement day yeah um of of things like this almost with the spell jammer actually being a big one of them like we mentioned spell jammer kind of just fell off the face of the earth as long as well as a lot of their products did but uh there was supposed to be this huge you know like 20 person cat rotating cast D game around spelljammer 
featuring people, you know, from Dimension 20, uh, internet people like Jenny D and others like her. Um, once we heard about it, we never heard about it again. Yeah. We heard about it at that when it was announced. It was, we, sh- we got to see all these characters. We were told, you know, what to expect. And then, I don't know. Just nothing. Just nothing comes of these things a lot of the time. I don't know why they're... I don't know why they're wasting their time with this stuff. They could have a Twitch channel and they can make whatever shows they want and they can just ha- stream it on Twitch, stream it on YouTube, and then have the VOD. They don't need to make a 24-hour TV station. Mm-hmm. That's a dumb idea. Cable, cable and network television is dying. You don't want to get on that train now. This is going to be a waste of time and money. And they already were, like, defunding E1 to begin with. So, it's like, what all. the fuck? Yeah. Have them make another D&D movie. Like, come on. It's ridiculous. A uh, couple wrap-up items. Uh, we're going to skip over the what what is the complete the practically complete Guide to Dragons, because we kind of already covered that. So, um, Leyline Press is a third-party indie publisher... Uh, they have their own product uh, that they're kickstarting uh, called Salvage Union, and they have also made uh, modules for D&D, Mothership, and some other um, tabletop RPGs. They have been in a little bit of a controversy about a week and a half ago uh, because of this thread of tweets that you are not able to reply to, saying, Dear all, Today it has come to our attention that one of our editors on Salvage Union is currently working on Lamentations of the Flame Princess and has been involved in other, quote, problematic works that have received widespread critique for bigotry and other harmful issues. We believe that these are highly problematic games by authors and companies whose politics and actions we vehemently disagree with. While we were unaware of this prior to hiring him, it was our responsibility to check the work of the work history of freelancers we work with. We are sorry that we did not do so as carefully as we should. We would also like to clear like to be clear that this editor had no developmental role in Salvage Union. He was hired as a freelancer on a freelance basis purely for proofing and editing. In order to avoid ourselves and our other contributors from being associated with these damaging politics and actions, we have removed the editor's name from all of the Salvage Union books, and we will not be working with them again in the future. We want to apologize to the tabletop community, featuring, including our readers and collaborators for this mistake. Yada, yada, yada. You can contact them. Uh, I found out about this from one, the DM lair, Luke Hart. Um, this is disturbing to me mm-hmm. um the dm lair luke he said okay you don't agree with their politics slash actions but removing their credit from publications they've worked on something i've been told multiple times is always pay freelancers and always give them the credit they deserve i would be hesitant to work with any company that might decide at any point even years from now to remove my credit from a work that's just not right no matter how much you disagree over politics The political landscape in the modern world is a fucking mess. There is, and I think, I think this is, you, this, ooh, controversial take here. I feel like there is one viewpoint in the world, at least in the Western world, that has overwhelming support from governments, companies, social media, the internet, and is very vocal and very quick to lambast people that disagree with them. And is very, very quick to do very unethical things in the name of moral superiority. A supposed moral superiority. I don't know anything about this editor. I don't really know very much about the the Flame Princess, the Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Because mm-hmm. honestly, it doesn't matter. Lamentations of the Flame Princess could be an allegory for how great Nazis are. And it doesn't really matter, because what really matters, to me at least, is the marketplace of ideas. If, the, if it is as bad as they think it is, then it's not going to sell. Then it's not going to be supported then people are going to lambast the product. Freelancers get paid 
to work on projects. There's a lot of freelancers that get paid to work on projects that they don't like, that they don't agree with the vision of, but that's not their place because they're not designing it, they're not creating it. Especially if you're hiring a freelancer as a proofreader and an editor for work that you've been working on, it is ridiculous to fire them because they've done something similar for a product that you don't like, that you disagree with the creators of, that you disagree with the politics of them, that's wrong. In the same way that it's wrong to fire someone from their job because their boss thinks one way and they think another way politically. And, e and it's even worse to say we're going to scrub their credits and name from products that we have already worked with them on and then not credit them for work that they've already done on this product prior to firing them. That's objectively wrong, period, full stop. I just, I, this isn't a huge news story. Barely anyone has seen this. But this is one of those... Connor wants to get up on his on his soapbox for a second because this shit pisses me off so much. It is so wrong. And the fact that it that this kind of behavior is just allowed to happen on the internet with seeming disregard for individuals, people's livelihoods. I'm not okay with that and I'm never going to be okay with that kind of behavior. Period. If you have anything to say, you can, but I don't Okay. Last thing. <laughs> Last thing. The orc license. Yes. The uh, the open. Oh gosh, I can never remember. The open RPG creative license, as created by Paizo, has a new update to it. Uh, second draft featuring changes based on feedback from the first draft that they received. Um, a lot of people participating in the orc license Discord community. Um, they've clarified a lot of the key terms and definitions, substantially increased the size and scope of the product's official FAQ, and introduces several basic quality of life improve improvements across the board. You can download a new copy of the ORC license and its associated FAQ, as well as its answers and explanations document, uh, from the Paizo website. And uh, they're, going to, they're going to have a lot of, they're, they're going to be accepting a lot of feedback through the rest of the month of May mm -hmm. as well. First off, answers and explanations, the, the abbreviation ACTS, is much cooler than FAQ. I agree. Um, <laughs> I agree. I will, I've, I, we, I believe we briefly looked at the first edition of the ORC, and I'm sure we'll take a, you know, take a glance at the future editions, but it'll be interesting to see what they finally land on, because uh, I have a corporate job. Yeah. Um, and as much as it sucks... You do see some interesting things, but uh, expansion of or increasing size and scope of um, not only the, I'm probably I'm sure it's not just the FAQ, but different parts of it in general always leads to uh, well, first off, the timeline getting pushed, um, but also headaches mm -hmm. left and right. Uh, so I'm I'm interested to see how they are dealing with the all the feedback that they are getting, and uh, you know. As the as the they end their statement, a new era of open gaming is nearly here. I'm excited to see what that will produce. Mm -hmm. You know how I'm I'm interested to see how how effective the open RPG creative license will be not only for companies but for gamers and if it actually affects mm -hmm. um, Wizards of the Coast like it's kind of supposed to. It when they announced it during the heat of all of the OGL controversy that was happening it was it was the perfect timing for them to announce that the but in the aftermath of the ogl debacle where the wizards of the coast open gaming license is creative commons has been released to the people if you will it it, it like the system's out there and it can't be retracted yep. legally it is not possible for them to try and copyright anything that was previously safe under the OGL. And their commitment to doing that in the future, we'll see how that plays out. Commitments are the word of corporations, mm -hmm. and you know how we feel about corporations. While not inherently evil, often not good for the people. No. Not good for the consumer. 
the orc license could be the the best way forward for a lot, but because because the OGL license is now Creative Commons, and if it is Creative Commons in the future with the release of One D and D, in many ways, uh, the orc license just kind of serves as a framework for people to let their own works mm-hmm. unrelated to D and D be available in some legal capacity, which I feel like is a bit niche of the tabletop RPG community. Not bad by any means. No. I love that they're improving it. I love that they're taking community feedback. You can check out the Paizo website. They'll have links for their Discord there. Uh, they have an entire Discord community that you can look into for the open RPG creative license and all of that. But that's all we got in terms of the news for today. Indeed. It seems. Kind of a light news week in, uh, in quantity. Not really necessarily in... Uh, Specifics. Not a not a fun day to be a fan of D and D and Magic the Gathering. I think, and uh, we're going to, as we always do, take questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from our audience, particularly those in the TikTok Live. From uh, when we record these, we record it every two weeks, usually on Tuesdays. Today it is on Wednesday, and the podcast will likely be posted late because we're smart. Uh, but we record the podcast live on TikTok. Every other week. Uh, You can also find the podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, uh, microwave ovens as well. Any, any, Any of your podcast services of choice, you can subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all of that stuff. Link and link trees in the bio. We have the merch store, all of that. But Samuel, the TikTok Live, what do we got? Uh, Regular and friend. uh, The Pirate Tom. Love love the Pirate Tom. How do you feel about Watsy's changing standard MTG play? Mm. Well... Standard is always being updated. Bans are always going to happen. Restrictions are always going to happen. That's the nature of these kind of ever-evolving card games. It's not like a board game where you can play test it to death and then you can set the rules and set the parameters and then just let it go. Um, whenever they design new cards, if they're breaking the mold, if they're doing new designs, if they're... They have such a wealth of cards that are out already, even a simple design when paired with another card that they released a year ago, two years ago, something that's still in whatever format, can break that format entirely. Um, And then some cards, they intend to be powerful, but end up being a lot more powerful than they're expecting. Something like Meat Hook Massacre from the Innistrad sets recently. The enchantment that you get minus X, minus X for X black black that can basically board wipe and then you get benefit from that board wipe. In addition, it remains as a permanent on the battlefield, and you get continued benefit from when your creatures die, which in a reanimator, in a sacrifice, any kind of deck like that, is going to be a lot more powerful. Bans are always going to happen. Banning for standard? I don't know. I'm, I don't play a lot of standard. <laughs> but bans are always going to happen for cards. So... If, if that's what they decide, then that's what they decide. But I their, their, their big problem right now is because they've expanded the window that MTG sets are going to remain in standard for the format. They're now going to have to ban a lot more cards because there's going to be a lot more cards for things to interact with and a lot more opportunities for things to be broken in the format. Fair. I don't play standard. Fair. <laughs> Fair. Um, all right. <clears throat> Endred Wintersbane says... That's a cool name. I believe when we were talking about the 24-hour D&D, or the 24-hour WotC show channel thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, they could pair... Uh, there could be a ton of potential if WotC pairs with Gamma, G-A-M-A, and, cel- and their celebrity D&D initiative. Hmm. Well, yeah... That would cost a lot of money. (laughs) That's the thing. Yeah. They could get, they could make 24 hours of daily content. Fill in the gaps with reruns of the cartoon, show the D&D movie every weekend, uh, reruns of all of their live plays, reruns of Heroes Feast, rerun, like all of this stuff. The Matthew Lillard show, I feel like they could put out one to two episodes a week that are new if they, if they really went and did that, you know, but that's not how that works anymore. Right. This isn't Saturday Night It's not going to be Saturday Night Live. No. Um, but 24 hours is a lot of time to fill every day. Mm-hmm. 
even if they were like, here's the video podcast two hours. And they did like, they have their, what is it? The weekly dungeon talks. Yeah. Like that kind of stuff. If they just set up a camera, didn't change the shot and just did like Joe Rogan experience style podcast. Well, not Joe, but like with video, a podcast with video is what I'm implying. Oh, like this one. Yes, like this one. Huh. Uh, we we don't po- we don't post the video on YouTube. This is just for the live part. But essentially, like this, just setting up a camera and then they do their normal podcast. Mm-hmm. That can fill an hour, two hours, once a week. Yeah, twenty four. What's twenty four times seven? Uh, one hundred sixty one. No, no. It's gonna be one hundred sixty eight. Yeah, one hundred sixty eight hours. All right. So, Matthew Lillard's show is, leaves it with 167 and a half. Then, the live play, let's say that's three hours, 164 and a half. The Heroes Feast, let's say that's an hour, Mm -hmm. 163 and a half. The cartoon, how long's the entire series, what? Uh, Oh, it's 30. 24 episodes. 24 episodes. I just looked it up, it's 24 episodes. 24 30 minute episodes, so another 12 hours. Yeah. 100, you see the problem? For a week of content, I I don't know what they're going to do. I genuinely have no clue how they're going to fill that time. It it was definitely one thing when uh, you know, a lot of, you know twenty four hour current channels even have this problem. Food Network, you oh get on God. Food Network and it's like, all right, Tuesday. Uh, I experienced this on vacation last year. We got we uh, last day of our vacation, we were exhausted, so we're just like, all right, we're just gonna sit around the hotel. Also, we got tattoos that day, so we're like, we can't go out in the sun. Um, we were just sitting around the hotel. One of our friends fell asleep. So the other three of us just watched eight hours of Beat Bobby Flay. Yep. And the day before, you know, the day here's, before we watched Guy Fieri well, for eight hours. Here's here's diners, drive-ins, and dives for the next twelve hours. Here's guys go shoot exactly, and it's going to be a. They, I mean, I get it. Not everybody's going to be trying to watch twenty-four hours, and they can, you know. Divide it up and rerun today's eight-hour Ob- segment. Obviously, things between, like, 11 p.m. and 9 a.m. are going to be just largely reruns mm-hmm. of stuff that's already happened. Same episode, like, ooh, our live play today was at 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. We'll replay that from midnight to 3. Mm-hmm. That kind of stuff. I get that. But still, it's even, but even then. Food Network has, you know... 10 years backlog of Diners, Dives, and Dives. Mm-hmm. They have five years backlog of Beat Bobby Flay. They can also buy in syndication wholesale mm-hmm. eight seasons of, like, Rachel Ray, eight seasons of what any any Hell's Kitchen, anything. Yeah. What D&D show, what D&D-related thing has existed long enough that you can just fill that time? There's one thing. But that thing is already has its own channel. Yeah. We're talking about Critical Role. Yes. <laughs> Which, by the way, the fact that Critical Role doesn't just have, like, a perpetual stream going on their Twitch page, I find a little surprising. I feel like they could straight up, starting from the stuff that they own, because a lot, obviously, Geek and Sundry, what do they own, what do they not own, like, that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. If they could come up with a syndication, whatever. Just every time they don't have a show that's live... Replay an old, replay episode. an old episode, and they were. Tra- and they- you could go straight through episode by episode, campaign one till current, and maybe every every week they make sure to, like, every Thursday leading into the episode they're about to do, they replay the last two. And even then, like they were starting to do that before the pandemic, before everything shut down, yeah. they had so many different shows between. Uh, you know, Talks Machina, Mini mm-hmm. Painting, Learn How to Draw, Everything is Content, all of those things. And they were starting to get a schedule going where it's like, oh, we're dropping yeah. Monday, here's our five hours. But now it's now it's. I'm honestly surprised they don't have more podcasting kind of content. Because obviously they're really focused on storytelling stuff, mm-hmm. especially with, um, what is it, Midst is the new like audio storytelling thing oh, yeah, that they're doing. Right. But why, why don't. Why don't they have a podcast? I don't know. Like, there's been, there's podcast, like, you see clips on TikTok all the time of a podcast where it's usually through, like, College Humor, where Brennan's talking to Abria, where Brennan's talking to Matt, where Brennan's talking, like, whoever. Why can't they do that? Any of the cast would be, I feel like, a good podcast host. Sam Regal would be a great podcast host. 
Here's an hour. Talk to Abria Iyengar about all the shit that you've been doing. Okay, Matt hosts, hosts this episode. Do, the DM Roundtable YouTube video they did with Matt, Abria, and Brennan is awesome. Mm-hmm. And that kind of content, like they could make it so simple because even even the the DM rounds table DM's roundtable was like produced with multiple cameras and editing, and they could make it very simple. And it's like we have our podcast booth. Here's the table with the microphones. Everything's always plugged in. Everything's always ready. Hit record one camera. Mm-hmm. There's your podcast. You have a video podcast you can put up, and then on the audio for all of the shit. That's easy content. I'm sorry. We're doing a podcast right now. It's easy content. Yeah. All things considered. I want to shout out the student for getting the number one gifter badge. Thank you. You can gift us uh, on our TikTok lives. Every other week we do the podcast and every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Time, depending on the time of year, which I think they're getting rid of daylight savings time finally. I think they've tried that multiple times. I, I don't know if it went through. I think, I, think this la- I think this one that's going to happen in 2024 is like the last time it'll change. Let's go team. Which I'm into. But 9 p.m. Eastern time, you can watch us play Magic the Gathering yeah. for like an hour and a half, two hours when the system works. Next week, the system will work. We're going old school. We're going old school. It'll work. MTG question, got lucky, 1986, says hello. Hello. Is the modern format dead? No. Modern... Modern... When it comes to format vintage, modern, those are formats where any pretty much anything that modern is basically anything that was ever been in standard can be in modern since like eighth edition. Mm-hmm. So, and they have a ban list that's similar to the standard ban lists that have come through. But modern is very high power. It's very expensive. Um, there's there's certain sh- like it, it's not an easy format to get into um and as such it's going to grow very slowly or maybe dwindle i don't think it'll ever go away because it's the one of the highest power formats in the game um having access to every standard legal card for the past like 20 years and getting play sets of four 60 card decks you can make it extremely consistent it's the format where you can get consistent turn one turn two turn three wins uh you get like urza's sagas breaking shit uh there there's it's not going to go away it's not going to grow very quickly either um that's kind of what modern is though so i don't think people would be very pleased about changing up modern to make it more accessible to make it grow the accessible format is commander Mm mm-hmm uh, if they wanted to grow an accessible format, design things for Popper. Yeah, that's a very one. That's a good Pion- one. Pioneer. They used to do the Pioneer decks, even. But, I don't know. What were you typing up? What were you looking uh, at? I just wanted to refresh myself. Um, user and a bunch of numbers says, how do you feel about the new five-color sliver? And I assume they're referring to the <laughs> Commander Master's sliver. Sliver Grave Mother. Yeah. Uh, Wooberg. The legend rule doesn't apply to slivers you control. Each sliver card in your graveyard has uh, has Encore X, where X is its mana value. And then the sliver grave mother itself has Encore 5, and it's a 6-6. Six, six. Mm-hmm. Encore is just returning something from the graveyard to the battlefield? Um, or copying it? Because I assume if it's removing the legend rule, then it's a copy thing. It is... Uh, you can... Exile it from your graveyard and create a token copy, I believe. Oh, for each, each opponent? I believe so. Let me double check that so we're not lying to you. That would make sense, though. Encore is an activated ability that you can pay the Encore cost and exile it uh, from your graveyard. You can... to If you do, you create a number of token copies equal to the number of opponents. For each, each of those tokens mm-hmm. gains haste and must attack that player and is sacrificed during the next end step. Okay, so kind of like Myriad. Yeah, it's, where Myriad is on attack. Yeah, and except instead it's if it's in a graveyard and you can exit. Okay. Yeah, uh, cool design. Slivers are fucked. <laughs> yeah, slivers are a very focused... Uh, um, you build your deck with slivers. Yep. Sometimes you can throw another sliver into another deck, but... Once, once, you, have, uh, once you have a sliver that gives all your slivers, like, an evasive keyword, menace, first strike, uh, flying... Uh, one that lets your slivers tap for mana, and then one of your sliver commanders out, it's it's fucked. It's fucked. 
Oh yeah, the deck's fucked. <laughs> the system's fucked. It's wrong. <laughs> it's bad. I love them. I would it, never play a sliver deck because it's too expensive. But I mean, you could just buy the uh, you could just buy the the, the precon the precon for like hundred and twenty dollars or something stupid. This one says one hundred and fifty. This says one ten. Fuck's sake, man! These commander master set this commander master set's gonna be busted. I hope they finally reprint those. Uh, those you can cast this spell for free if your commander's on battlefield one like the the deflecting oh, slot yeah. that kind of stuff i will say with the slivers um i felt i like slivers because it is a very specific tribal like you can build i mean you can build soldiers but not all soldiers go into a soldier tribal deck yeah or you can build wolves and not every or a werewolf deck and not every werewolf goes into a werewolf deck but with slivers it's like oh all my slivers can go in my slivers deck they all benefit from all the slivers that i have and they benefit all the slivers that i have and you can definitely see that they tried to do that with some other things. Like, they did that with uh, Myconid or Fungus. Yeah. Um, where it's like, oh, all fung- basically all that have the subtype Fungus have... It gains a, on your upkeep, it gains a Spore Counter, remove three uh, Spore Counters from this creature to create a, a Sapperling or something like that. Yeah. And I was looking through and I found another one that said, each creature you control has remove two Spore Counters to create a, two Sapperlings. I was like, man, I would love... And I know they've tried to do this with a couple other types of tribal making them these complete tribals these mm. self-contained tribals yeah i would love to do, see that if they did that more or try it again with just not slivers yeah but I could, I could see that but that's kind of slivers thing yeah it is slivers thing yeah and oh man the th- the the thing with slivers is that as long as long as there isn't a sliver that removes the ability of like exiling mm-hmm. i think it'll be fine because there's a lot a lot of board wipes, there's a lot of mass removal that exile cards. True. Destroy is a problem because what because of what is it? The one that gives queen, indestructible. Yeah, it, queen sliver, mother sliver, some one one of the one of the five color sliver commanders that exists gives everything indestructible, excuse me. Uh so yeah. Slivers are fucked. I love them. Windy Bank Cat Sanctuary. Can we interest you in a cat? Uh we have one. She is where where oh, I'm going to get her. Vamp. Bam. Ah, ah, oh my god, I'll keep scrolling through. Um, oh, she was napping. Oh, she was napping. We're interrupting the cat anyway. Um, I'm very bad at vamping, apparently. Also, I realized I had a wireless mic on, so at least the live can still hear me. Oh, the baby. All we right. got the baby. We have the baby. The baby. Shout out to Young X Winter. Just got the number one gifter badge. Thank you. Do you have something to say, Jester? Good job. <laughs> Matthews.biz, can you explain power levels of commander decks? Nope. So power levels of commander decks are very subjective, even though people... Yeah. You can... There, there's so many different uh, YouTube creators and other creators who have tried to s- rectify that and tried to give it an actual scale. Unfortunately, you know, if you look at the professor's video versus the uh, uh, yeah. game nights... Or not game nights. Oh. Um, command zone video versus um, you know, other videos, it's very hard to quant- quantify... Here's the problem for me. I, I saw, I can't remember what video I was watching where they discussed it like this, but level, like there was an, at some point an official power level, quote unquote official power level scale that the community kind of agreed on. Mm-hmm. And it said pre-constructed commander decks generally are level five. Mm-hmm. And that is a very static thing. Whereas... Certain commander decks, when they release, like commanders and decks that are built around them, when they release, might be an 8. And then after new commanders come out, they go down to a 7, and then a 6, and then suddenly everything... We have the problem now where, like, every commander deck is like, oh, this is a power level, like, 7, like Mm -hmm. a 6, because there's a new 10. Right. Then the old 10 becomes 9, and then the old 9 becomes 8, and then the old... But the lower limit is 5, because they're all still more powerful than pre-cons. Yeah. So I think the scale, just generally speaking, is, is also always moving. Is too old, and now it's too crowded in the above five part of the scale. Also, I am impressed that the cat is just like vibing here right now. When it comes to actually kind of talk, you know, that rule zero conversation, um, what I have seen, uh, not that we've played too much actual commander, we mostly play one on one commander, which is very different. Um, certain oh, yeah. certain commanders are worthless when it comes to that. Any goad commanders are completely worthless in yes. one one. And uh, my feather the redeem deck is just gonna stomp you. Yeah, pretty much. I don't have anything aggressive enough to take it out. But you know, talking about you know 
what the deck wants to do, what turn it wants to win on, you know. How consistently it can do that. Yeah. Um, We're going to put the cat on the table. And also, then it comes, it also partially comes down to uh, how aggressive you are as a player, how. uh, How good your starting hand is, how consistent you can get a good starting hand. How good you are at bargaining, how much other people at the table want to bargain. Yeah. Um, how good of a pilot are you? Because there's one there's one thing that I saw from uh, the professor at Tularean Community College where he was talking about deck building versus piloting a deck are two very different skills. Mm-hmm. And some of the best deck builders in the world are not very good pilots of the decks that they build. And some of the best pilots for decks in the world are not very good at building decks and mm-hmm. creating brews themselves. Um, it, it's... it's it's a it's a spectrum. It's varied, but just as just as uh, uh, that's why you want to have that. Uh, from yeah. what I understand, that's why you want to have that rule zero conversation. Comparing it to like mm-hmm. the less, I feel the less common D and D rule zero conversation, though also important session zero session zero. But having that talk of okay, what power level you know or not? What how how aggressive do we want this campaign to be? Do we want are we cool with uh, you know are we cool with Darren's paladin just smiting everything in round one yes. and the rest of us not doing anything during combat but he's yeah but maybe have him back that kind of thing it's a whole thing you know if you're playing a game especially as open as as mm. the those produced by wizards of the coast yeah uh, you remember the earlier days of the podcast when we would record down in the living room and we could never get the cat to lay in the cat bed yeah and now she's just jay chilling here i'm into that uh i'm also terrified because she has a paw on my uh laptop's mouse pad that like she'll stop the recording or, or something ridiculous. Moonlit says, Moonlit just got the number one gifter badge. Hey, thank you. Shout out to Moonlit. And the Pirate Tom, this is the last, the last note. I believe this is very ba- very recent, as in, uh, Pirate Tom, I see it all the time. People build a deck on EDH rec, but mm-hmm. can't pilot it. Yep. That is what I definitely hate going on EDH rec or going on Moxfield and being like, I, you know, I kind of want to see what other people are doing. Oh, this deck costs uh, $3,000 because they put the only the most expensive and yeah. best card. Well, for- and those and those are the people that are bad at deck building. <laughs> no offense. I feel like I am slightly better at piloting a deck than I am at building a deck Mm -hmm. personally. So I I utilize a lot of tools to help out with like what are the popular cards just because I don't know. Because there are a lot of cards out there. So many cards out there. But yeah, I I definitely have the struggle of I want to do very weird and niche things with my deck. You're good at making, you're good at building the decks. You're better at building decks than I am I think. Hmm. I think I'm better at piloting decks than you are though. But yeah. I don't know. We've never really experimented with piloting decks we haven't built. I would. I think that'd be a fun. That'd be a fun Monday Night Magic at nine PM at the Dungeon Bros TikTok. Uh, that'd be a fun thing where you pick one of your decks for me to play, and I pick one of my decks for you to play, uh, and we can agree on them. I think. I think it's also something that we should just like we shouldn't discuss it beforehand. Just like we start the live, and it's like, all right, I want you to play uh, Ivy, and I'll be like, okay, I want you to play uh, Vishgras, and then we just go. We go. You know. Anywho. The cat is still just kind of vibing here. I'm into this. She's having a time of her life. Yes. Uh, we do not need to adopt a cat. We already have one. But She's a handful. Currently, she's a multiple armful. Hand. Currently, she's a, she is an arm and table full. Anyway, that's all that we got from the, the life yep. chat. That is, this is wonderful. Episode 41 of the Dungeon Bros podcast, Done and Dusted. Remember? Uh, remember to check out our sponsor, uh, Widow We Hit and Equity. When you roll a natural twenty, natural twenty. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how I don't know how people feel about the joke sponsors. I don't, we haven't we haven't received any feedback on the joke sponsors. No. I enjoy the joke sponsor. Oh, oh. Yeah, it's our show. Let's do it. Beans on the move and oh. Be, oh, beans on beans on the ground. And she knocked over her phone. All right. Well, I think that is as good a time as any to end this, the Dungeon Bros podcast. Uh, again, you can find this on Apple, Google, Spotify. Uh, reviewing on the various um, on the various platforms is is one of the best ways to help us out. Uh, like going, you can only rev- I think you can only review on the Spotify desktop, not the app. But I've you, tried. If you go to Apple Apple Podcasts, or if you're if you're watching the live, or if you wherever you watch it, going to one in one of the podcast services, liking it, rating it, giving a review, all that kind of stuff, really helps out the podcast and the metrics and growth on the back end. Uh, but is all we have for you today. We love you very much. And in the meantime, peace out.